Well, let me call this meeting to order. Welcome everyone to the July 2011 FCC meeting. Let us begin with uh, Madam Secretary. Please introduce our agenda for this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you Thanks. and good morning, Commissioners. Today's agenda includes two items for your consideration. First, as part of the Broadband Acceleration Initiative, a report and order, further notice of proposed rulemaking, and memorandum opinion and order addressing several proposals to remove regulatory barriers to, to the full and effective use of certain spectrum bands for wireless backhaul to promote broadband deployment. The item also addresses other ways to make additional spectrum available for wireless backhaul. Second, as part of the regulatory reform efforts, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking to reduce regulatory burdens and streamline the review process for foreign ownership of common carrier radio licensees and certain aeronautical radio licensees under Section 310B4 of the Communications Act, while ensuring the Commission continues to receive the information it needs to serve the public interest. This item does not address issues related to foreign ownership of broadcast licensees. This is your agenda for today. The first item will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Rick Kaplan, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you. Mr. Kaplan, is this your first item as Bureau Chief? It is. Congratulations. Thank you. The floor I is can't yours. take any credit for it. I have to get to Ruth, <laughs> but I'll, I'll take the balls from the uh, two, two yard line to the end. <laughs> Perfect. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Almost exactly one year ago, drawing from recommendations in the National Broadband Plan, the Commission initiated a proceeding to evaluate and improve the rules governing wireless backhaul. Today we present what we anticipate to be the first installment of modification to these rules. As we will explain in greater detail, the actions we propose remove artificial regulatory barriers that inhibit the use of spectrum for wireless backhaul and other point-to-point -point communications. Among the results, increased broadband service in areas covering more than half of the nation's landmass, providing additional service to about 10% of the population, primarily in rural areas. We believe that this item meets a number of the Commission's important goals, not the least of which is to update our rules to help facilitate the swift and ubiquitous deployment of fourth generation mobile broadband networks and increase product productive investment in these networks. Joining me today at the table is our talented team of John Leibovitz, Deputy Bureau Chief, Blaise Sinto, Chief of the Bureau's Broadband Division, John Schauble, Deputy T Chief of the Broadband Division, and Charles Oliver, an attorney in the Broadband Division. Mr. Oliver will present today's item. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The draft item before you today updates the Commission's rules to facilitate the provision of fixed microwave services, which are often used as wireless backhaul in support of mobile wireless networks. The item, consisting of a report in order, a further notice of proposed rulemaking, and a memorandum opinion and order, increases the amount of spectrum available for fixed wireless use, eliminates outdated regulations, improves the capacity of fixed microwave links, and increases the cost effectiveness with which they may be used. Microwave is an increasingly useful middle mile component of broadband networks. In mobile wireless networks, backhaul facilities are used to transmit voice or data between cell sites or between cell sites and network backbones. As such, backhaul facilities are critical to the delivery of mobile broadband service. Backhaul costs currently constitute a significant portion of a mobile wireless operator's network operating expense and the demand for backhaul capacity is increasing. In the report in order, we take several steps to remove regulatory barriers that have impeded the use of microwave spectrum and to make additional spectrum available for wireless backhaul. The item allows fixed microwave operations to share certain spectrum bands that are currently reserved for specialized microwave services such as the broadcast auxiliary service and the cable TV relay service, 
subject to limitations to safeguard these existing operations. The item also eliminates the outdated final link rule, which should provide broadcasters with additional flexibility to use microwave spectrum. The report in order also modifies the Part 101 minimum payload capacity rule to allow adaptive modulation or temporary operations below the minimum capacity under certain circumstances. This change will enable fixed microwave links to maintain critical communications during periods of atmospheric fading increasing the reliability and cost effectiveness of these links. Finally, the item declines to permit fixed microwave licensees to simultaneously coordinate and deploy auxiliary links. The record does not allow the Commission to conclude that such auxiliary links could operate with and protect existing point-to-point -point links. In the Further notice of proposed rulemaking, we continue our efforts to reduce regulatory barriers to the use of microwave spectrum by seeking comment on several additional ideas designed to facilitate the use of microwave spectrum for wireless backhaul and other vital purposes. For example, the FNPRM seeks comment on allowing smaller antennas in several microwave bands, which could result in cost savings for licensees and allow more deployments of microwave facilities. In addition, the FNPRM seeks comment on exempting licensees in non-congested areas from the minimum capacity requirements, which may enable longer, more cost-effective fixed microwave links in rural areas. The FNPRM also seeks comment on several additional ideas to reduce the cost of deployment, update our regulations to take into account modern technologies, and conform our regulations to international standards. Finally, in the memorandum, opinion, and order, we address various proposals offered by commenters that lack specificity are outside the scope of this proceeding or are not yet ripe for consideration. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and if uh, nothing else from our team, let me ask our uh, uh, bench for comments. Commissioner Cobbs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope you all will pardon my voice and wheezing. I got a summer cold, as a matter of fact. Chairman and I met yesterday and I advised him to sit the requisite six feet away and he did but I noticed he sneezed a minute ago so I may be in, I may be in serious trouble here I don't know uh, this is a uh, a good item for the Commission it's uh, uh, especially good item for uh, Rick's first uh, presentation here as, as chief of the bureau and it's especially good news for rural consumers uh, rural wireless consumers uh, because we're making good uh, one more step in realizing the National Broadband Plan and uh, implementing its recommendation for more availability of microwave in rural America and we also go on to set the stage for more action to decrease deployment costs for this technology and that's uh, uh, this is something that's increasingly important as we move toward a 4G world. The current spectrum crunch we are all increasingly aware is also a backhaul crunch and microwave is often the answer in rural areas where it may not be economical or feasible to run fiber. The benefits of mobile broadband are at this point obvious. What's equally obvious, I think, is that no one should be left behind because of where they happen to live. This order clears the regulatory way to making greater use of 650 megahertz spectrum for microwave, and that will benefit uh, those in approximately half of America's land mass. Uh, or 10 percent of our population and those are some pretty serious and pretty impressive numbers. At the same time, uh, the item rightfully acknowledges the interests of microwave spectrum neighbors in the, in the bands, broadcast auxiliary service and cable TV relay service, so today we take appropriate and I think entirely reasonable 
steps to uh, make sure these services can coexist. Uh, for example, we reserve two nationwide channels for BAS and cars to accommodate TV pickup stations covering events that occur outside of their license areas. Still, there's more we can do. Today's further notice asks questions about additional steps we can take to encourage greater use of microwave backhaul. Always aware, of course, that we have to be alert to guard against interference and always sensitive to our obligation to promote spectrum efficiency. But uh, examining our current technical standards for antennas and efficiency and channel size, all of these things present additional opportunities to increase the presence of and competition in microwave backhaul. As an example, tower sighting costs and a lack of desirable antenna positions drive up provider costs. Exploring our antenna standards may help bring some relief. And I look forward to hearing from all interested parties on issues such as these. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank the Bureau uh, and the Chairman for moving us forward on an increasingly uh, uh, important matter for rural consumers and taking one more step toward realization of the broadband plan. Thank you very much. Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And feel free to keep that handkerchief I lent you. Um, <laughs> I am uh, voting to approve this order and uh, further notice the proposed rulemaking because uh, the actions we take today are consistent with my longstanding commitment uh, to creating meaningful competitive opportunities for cost-efficient backhaul, backhaul, which ultimately benefits America's consumers. I'm pleased that we are removing regulatory barriers that unnecessarily hamper the ability to enter the marketplace for wireless backhaul and other point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint communications. We are also making additional spectrum available for this purpose, as well as seeking comment on allowing wider channels and smaller antennas in certain bands. Uh, with these actions, the Commission is taking yet another step to spur the construction of advanced broadband services. I thank the very talented group and the Wireless uh, Telecommunications Bureau, Bureau for your work in this very highly uh, technical uh, proceeding. And I look forward to reviewing the record uh, resulting from uh, the further notice with the hope that we will be able to do more to, pr uh, to promote uh, flexible, cost-effective uh, microwave services in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McDowell. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. The federal government is often criticized by those who believe that pro-consumer regulation automatically harms business development. This item is an example of how the FCC uses its regulatory authority to the benefit of both consumers and businesses. By adopting the rules in this item, the Commission takes important steps to give mobile service consumers, particularly those living in rural areas, more competitive choices. How? By encouraging businesses to deploy more services. As our past two mobile services reports have demonstrated, backhaul transport is necessary to deploy mobile service. But backhaul imposes significant costs on mobile service providers, especially in rural areas. Providers are increasing their use of microwave communications to reduce those costs. So by permitting microwave communications in more spectrum bands, these rules enhance the flexibility of service providers to find the most cost-effective backhaul transport solutions for the respective business models. These changes to Part 101 of our rules could enable as much as 650 megahertz of spectrum for backhaul transport in rural areas. Consequently, these rules enhance the ability for rural consumers to receive mo more mobile services. They also create new business opportunities for companies that want to offer more backhaul transport to mobile service providers and companies that seek to serve mobile wireless consumers. I was pleased to see that the item does not stop at adopting rules to permit more use of microwave communications in rural areas. It also adopts a further notice on proposals that could further reduce the cost to deploy mobile wireless services. For example, allowing the use of smaller antennas should lower the cost that providers currently incur to manufacture and maintain antennas. This proposal could also allow existing towers to accommodate more antennas. Co-location of antennas tends to streamline the process for obtaining local government approval in siting applications. Therefore, smaller antennas should also reduce administrative costs associated with network deployment. The proposal to permit wider channel bandwidth in the 6 and 11 gigahertz bands is also promising for those rural areas that are hardest to serve. Wider channels 
allow providers to build backhaul links that are more reliable and able to accommodate increased demand for de broadband services. It is possible in the least populated rural areas that there is sufficient spectrum available in the 6 and 11 gigahertz bands to allow the use of wider channels and spur greater deployment of wireless broadband services. I encourage the industry to continue to provide us with creative proposals. I commend Chairman Janikowski for his leadership and directing the staff to find practical solutions to the challenges facing mobile service providers in rural areas. And I wish to thank Rick Kaplan and his talented team at the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau for their hard work on this important item. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Uh, so today we're uh, implementing another key recommendation of the National Broadband Plan by unleashing additional spectrum to help drive our economy. We're doing so by removing regulatory barriers to efficient spectrum use and rapid broadband build out. Now, I will confess that when uh, uh, John uh, first briefed me on this topic during the National Broadband Plan and said, uh, we really should do this. We should uh, lift restrictions in BAS spectrum so that we can allow more microwave point to point for wireless backhaul. My eyes glazed over. And uh, I said, yeah, you want a national broadband plan. Yeah, that's true. It sounds fine. Um, uh, but I've come to see that this is uh, one of the most important uh, 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 recommendations in the plan, and I'm extremely pleased that we're acting on it today. Because uh, as I think you've probably gathered from listening to the staff and the other commissioners, uh, what we're doing here uh, fits into, uh, in an important way, uh, several key initiatives that together we're all pursuing at the agency. Uh, it's an important step in our spectrum agenda, recognizing the powerful role that wireless communications can play in economic revitalization. It's another important step in our broadband acceleration initiative, recognizing the importance of job cre to job creation of accelerating broadband build out and reducing its costs. And it's another important step in our regulatory reform agenda, recognizing our ongoing commitment to removing or reforming outdated regulations. And let me briefly discuss ease, each. Spectrum first is the invisible infrastructure that enables mobile communications, and this is a spectrum item. Uh, mobile communications obviously are growing more rapidly than ever. We know that uh, there are now more smartphones being sold than PCs, and smartphones use 24 times as much spectrum as traditional feature phones. Uh, tablets, which didn't exist two years ago at all, use 122 times as much spectrum. Without taking our fundamental role in spectrum management seriously, uh, and without freeing up additional spectrum for mobile broadband, demand will soon exceed supply uh, and will feel very serious cost to our economy and to consumers if we let that happen. Uh, voluntary incentive auctions would provide a market-based mechanism to address the nation's rapidly growing need for spectrum, yield many billions of dollars for taxpayers in the construction of a nationwide interoperable public safety mobile broadband network, and lead to the creation of thousands of jobs and billions of dollars of private investments. Why the concept uh, enjoys bipartisan support, uh, and it's been advocated by over 100 economists from across the ideological spectrum. Uh, incentive auctions are incredibly important, and they are also not the only item on our spectrum agenda, as, you, as you've seen. And across the board, we've been working together to remove restrictions that unnecessarily keep spectrum locked up. Today, we remove more needless restrictions on spectrum use. Backhaul, as you've heard, is the skeleton supporting uh, broadband. The tissue's already gone. Is there <laughs> we should bring some more. Um, uh, wireless backhaul is often a very efficient means of transmitting data among cell sites or between cell sites and network backbone. Spectrum, in other words, can be an important part of what's called the middle mile of broadband networks. And indeed, wireless technology is an increasingly important source of backhaul, and particularly in rural and remote locations, maybe the only practical high-capacity backhaul solution available. Uh, as Commissioner Kopp said, there's a spectrum crunch with respect to 
back call or middle mile as there is with respect to the consumer facing piece that we more often discuss, this item is a very important part of our strategy for addressing that. And so today by eliminating unnecessary restrictions on the use of the spectrum, we encourage more spectrum efficiency and free up more spectrum to help drive economic and public benefits. Second, broadband is a bright spot in our economy. Wired and wireless broadband connects people in their communities to the larger economy and opens up new worlds of commerce and opportunity, promoting innovation, investment, and new jobs. This has been true even in the very difficult economy that we have been experiencing. Just last week, I was proud to visit Jeffersonville, Indiana to announce a broadband-based initiative that'll create 100,000 call center jobs over the next two years. Those call center jobs are all broadband enabled and the announcement would not have been possible without broadband infrastructure and without broadband adoption. Broadband infrastructure is essential for customer service reps at call centers to process transactions, access records, manage accounts and information, and engage in VoIP calls, emailing and live text chatting. Um, uh, it's a, a wonderful confluence of positive trends that are helping bring a number of offshore job back onshore through initiatives like this. Part of that involves the opportunities for many of these jobs to be in people's homes where people with disabilities, disabled veterans, single parents, et cetera, can be eligible for these jobs wherever they live as long as they have broadband infrastructure and have adopted broadband in their home. Making sure broadband infrastructure is everywhere is plain and simple a job creation strategy. That's why we launched our broader broadband acceleration initiative of which this item today is a part. The broader initi initiative focuses on ways to reduce barriers to broadband infrastructure deployment, to speed broadband build out and reduce costs. In this regard, working together, this commission has established a shot clock for the approval process for siting wireless towers and, atten and antennas. Together, we've adopted a comprehensive reform of our pole attachment rules, making it easier and more efficient for wired and wireless broadband providers to attach equipment to utility and telephone poles. I'm pleased, by the way, that last week, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals denied a motion to stay application of our pole attachment rules. I uh, can't resist the opportunity to say that that is consistent with our 94% success rate where a direct statutory challenge is made to an FCC order. And it's consistent with our success rate in the DC circuit in general, where in three of every four cases, the commission wins on every single issue presented. And we prevail on some or all issues 91% of the time. Uh, our general counsel, Austin Schleich, is sitting at the table. I thank you and your talented staff for the work that you do, uh, both on the front end and the back end of our orders uh, to develop that truly excellent track record. <laughs> Multi efficient use of commission meetings is permitted. Um, so our action today is another important milestone in our broadband uh, acceleration uh, initiative, particularly important in accelerating broadband and accelerating fast broadband uh, to rural businesses and rural consumers. Finally, our action today is another important milestone in our regulatory reform agenda. Simply put, today we are lifting unnecessary and outdated regulatory restrictions on spectrum use. Uh, the next item we're doing is also is a similar item, and so I'll save some comments uh, uh, for that. But let me say here that the actions that we're taking in today's wireless backhaul item uh, are somewhat technical in nature. Uh, this is more of the blood and guts of the FCC doing its job. Uh, but this order will help Americans and help our economy. It'll do so by advancing our agency spectrum agenda, our broadband acceleration initiative, and our regulatory reform agenda, by freeing up spectrum for backhaul in rural areas. We're enabling service providers to extend broadband services more efficiently to rural and underserved communities and to improve broadband speeds where service already exists. There's a public safety benefit as well to our action today. The further step we take of permitting microwave licensees to take advantage of the latest technology 
and maintain the reliability of critical links can help make the difference in ensuring that emergency communications, including 911 calls, are maintained even in severe weather in rural areas. We recognize that there's more we can potentially do to lift restrictions and free up more spectrum for wireless backhaul, which is why the further notice we adopt today explores additional ideas for making microwave communications more flexible and more cost effective. Uh, this is a terrific uh, order, a terrific proceeding. Uh, I thank uh, uh, the staff of the Wireless Bureau, uh, um, Charles and John and Blaze and John, you've been working on this for a long time and I know it's been a priority of the Wireless Bureau. I really appreciate it. Uh, Rick, you swept in and uh, 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 help bring it over the finish line, and I appreciate that. And I want to thank each of uh, my colleagues on the commission for working together uh, 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 on this item, which, as I said, will make um, a very positive difference for our economy and for rural America. With that, let us proceed to a vote. All those uh, in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, so ordered, and the request for editorial privileges is granted. Uh, thank you all very much. Madam Secretary, please announce our next item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the second item on your agenda will be presented by the International Bureau. It is entitled Review of Foreign Ownership Policies for Common Carrier and Aeronautical Radio Licensees under Section 310B4 of the Communications Act. Uh, Mandel, please, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Is this on? Yes, now yes. it is. Um, I see that I'm the requisite six feet away, so I think our staff is safe <laughs> here. We have our little wall of, uh, of, of security. Anyway, today I'm pleased to have my senior staff from the International Bureau's Policy Division uh, present a notice of proposed rulemaking that would seek comments on ways to reduce regulatory burdens and streamline the review process for foreign ownership of common carrier and certain aeronautical licenses. During the uh, preparation of this item, I came to quickly appreciate how complex this area is. Um, the challenges involved in applying our existing foreign ownership policies as well. So I welcome the initiative and dedication of my expert staff, they also are talented as well, um, to try to find ways to streamline our foreign ownership um, review processes. Now, this is also while being very careful to ensure that we maintain our public interest responsibilities and facilitate necessary reviews by other U.S. government agencies. And I'd like to thank the Policy Division and the International Bureau uh, Front Office staff involved in these foreign ownership mat uh, matters, including Susan O'Connell, Kate Collins, Howard Griboff, uh, David Crutch, Jim Ball, Francis Gutierrez, and Troy Tanner for all their hard work. I'd also like to thank our colleagues um, in the Office of General Counsel, as they've been very useful as well, the Media Bureau, Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and Public Safety and Homeland Security for their assistance with this item. This item definitely uh, flows over into many other bureaus. Now with me at the table today are um, Howard Griboff, the Deputy um, Chief of the Policy Division, Susan O'Connell, Attorney Advisor at the po in the Policy Division, and Kate Collins, um, Attorney Advisor in the Policy Division. And Susan, who is probably the single most knowledgeable person on um, the 310B uh, uh, regulations, is, uh, is going to present the item today. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The notice of proposed rulemaking before you today is another step in the Commission's continuing regulatory reform efforts. Section 310B4 of the Communications Act establishes a 25% benchmark for foreign investment in U.S. companies that directly or indirectly control common carrier and certain aeronautical radio licensees, as well as broadcast licensees. This section of the Act also grants the Commission discretion to allow higher levels of foreign ownership in U.S. parent companies, unless the Commission finds that such ownership would be inconsistent with the public interest. The Commission has issued approximately 150 petitions for declaratory ruling authorizing foreign investment in U.S. telecommunications carriers since 1998, when the Commission implemented the Foreign Participation Order's Open Entry Standard 
for foreign investors from countries that are members of the World Trade Organization, or WTO. Practical application of the policies adopted in the foreign participation order has proven to be complex. Wireless licensees seeking commission approval of foreign ownership under Section 310b4 face significant difficulties and expense in trying to ascertain their percentages of foreign ownership, whether existing or planned, from particular countries. Many of these proceedings generate voluminous records consisting of highly detailed information that companies must compile as to the citizenship and principal places of business of their investors, including individuals and entities that hold very small interests directly or indirectly through multiple intervening investment vehicles and holding companies. Each of these cases also requires commission staff to undertake a fact-intensive, time-consuming review of the company's ownership information to confirm that its non-WTO ownership does not exceed 25 percent. Moreover, the information that licensees are able to provide for the record gives us only a snapshot of their foreign ownership, which reflects the licensee's ownership at the time of the proceeding. As a result, the licensee that has um, received a ruling must return to the Commission, often repeatedly, for additional approval under Section 310b4. Based on more than 13 years of experience in applying the principles of the Foreign Participation Order, International Bureau staff believes the Section 310b4 filing requirements and review process are due for re-examination to determine whether the Commission can reduce delay, uncertainty, and expense for U.S. wireless licensees and potential investors, thereby reducing barriers to investment to the ultimate benefit of U.S. consumers. The notice would seek comment on measures to revise and simplify the Commission's regulatory framework under Section 310b4. It would propose to codify whatever measures the Commission ultimately adopts to provide more predictability and ensure transparency of the Commission's filing requirements and review process. The International Bureau staff estimates that adopting the proposals and other options discussed in the notice would result in a more than 70 percent reduction in the number of Section 310b4 petitions filed with the Commission annually. We also anticipate a reduction in the time and expense associated with filing petitions. Among other things, the notice seeks comment whether to reduce the need for repeated filings by U.S. companies after they receive an initial ruling by allowing the parent to re uh, request specific approval for foreign investors named in the petition to increase their interests in the parent at any time after issuance of the ruling up to a predefined limit. The notice also asks whether the Commission should issue rulings in the name of the U.S. parent of the licensee and allow for automatic extension of the U.S. parent's ruling to cover any of its subsidiaries or affiliates whenever formed, provided the U.S. parent remains in compliance with the terms of its ruling. Under the framework proposed in the notice, the Commission would continue to require that licensees obtain Commission approval before aggregate direct or indirect foreign ownership of their controlling U.S. parent companies exceeds 25% and that licensees obtain Commission approval under Section 310D of the Act for any assignment or transfer of control of a radio license. In addition, the Commission would continue to coordinate all requests to exceed the 25 percent benchmark in Section 310B4 with the appropriate executive branch agencies and accord deference to their views in matters related to national security, law enforcement, foreign policy, and trade policy. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all of you. And let's proceed to the bench. Commissioner Cobbs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is an important uh, item. I support the uh, notice asking questions about our processes regarding foreign ownership uh, matters under Section 310 of the Telecommunications Act. 
Uh, it's an important issue because it can go to matters of national security and national competitiveness. And that's truer than ever in this age of technology revolution with the uh, power and influence that accompany all of these new uh, tools and, and services. So we need, uh, first of all, I think, to be sure in whatever we do going forward on this item, that we understand the extent of foreign ownership uh, in our telecommunications industries, that we have the benefit of a good assessment of when it, what impact it has actually had, what direction it's tending, and what have been its uh, benefits and its costs to American consumers, to American businesses, and to America's national security and its well-being. Uh, we need to be sure the right questions are asked here and that we avoid any outcome that might, might not be in the interests of our trade policy and our other important national interests. So while I support exploring reasonable ways to relax unnecessary filing requirements, I don't want us to assume going in that all of them are patently or unnecessarily onerous. Some of the proposals here will make good sense. For example, issuing foreign ownership decisions in the name of the U.S. parent of the licensee, <coughs> the entity to whom Section 310B4's foreign ownership requirements apply rather than the licensee. But there are others where we need to be cautious and thoughtful. The current distinction between WTO and non-WTO countries is a good example. Any proposal to do away with this distinction in the name of making life easier on applicants uh, may not be entirely without risk. The number of WTO countries has shot up from 69 in 1998, the last time I think that we revisited these processes, from uh, 69 then to 153 today. The relatively few remaining non-WTO countries include Iran and Libya. I will keep an open mind as we analyze the record, but it's not as all clear, it is not at all clear to me that we should be giving these countries the presumption of open markets that we have accorded WTO countries. As to the cost to parties to comply with our filing requirements, I will be looking for specific, granular, and credible evidence uh, a good bit of anecdotal evidence suggests to me that the regulatory burdens associated with our foreign ownership reviews have hardly discouraged foreign investment in the United States telecom market. Reducing corporate costs is a worthy goal. I'm supportive of it, but it must not come at the expense of ignoring our other clear congressional mandates. I also want to emphasize the importance of commission coordination with our federal partners in this area, something I think that was already mentioned. We must continue to work closely with our fellow expert agencies, uh, such as the Department of Justice and the United States Trade Representative, to properly evaluate the effects of proposed foreign ownership of licensees. We bring an expertise to that dialogue that no one else possesses. And additionally, we must always be cognizant of our special FCC charge to regulate the public airwaves in the public interest. Congress put serious and I think generally pretty clear obligations on the FCC <coughs> to probe deeply all aspects of foreign ownership. And we need to be vigilant that nothing we do in any of these proceedings hamstrings us from conducting the depth and breadth of analysis necessary to ensure that the intent of Congress in Section 310 is met. Uh, my thanks to uh, Mendel and our fine International Bureau team for bringing this item to us. I look forward to a fulsome record. I encourage all parties to, uh, to contribute to that record. As I said at the outset, it is an important issue, uh, particularly in uh, critical economic times uh, such as these. And I look forward to working with the, both the Bureau and my Commission colleagues to craft workable and effective processes in this very important area. And thank I thank you. you. Thank you very much. C Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our globe is shrinking. As economic and political freedom proliferates, the economies of the world are becoming increasingly interdependent. As such, investment capital flows more freely across borders than at any time in our history. Capital is attracted to opportunity, and the U.S. offers tremendous economic opportunities to investors of all nations, especially in the information, communications, and technology sector, the ICT sector. 
Foreign investment continues to be an important source of financing for U.S. telecommunications companies and ultimately fosters technical innovation, economic growth, and job creation within America's borders. Yet, in most instances, wireless licensees face significant regulatory hurdles in obtaining approval of foreign ownership under Section 310B4 of the Act. These include considerable time commitments and an investment of significant expenses, just to name two. This fact-intensive and time-consuming approval process is also a strain on the Commission's own scarce resources. Regulatory barriers such as these inhibit investment in U.S. companies. Our economic resilience is what suffers most as a result. Thankfully, Congress has given us the flexibility to modernize our policies and rules in this area. And I applaud Chairman Janikowski for bringing this review forward. I also thank the Chairman for his willingness uh, to accept edits that allow for detailed comment on the levels of foreign ownership in the wireless marketplace, the benefits associated with foreign equity, as well as the distinction between WTO and non-WTO member investment established by the Commission back in 1997. Although we do not seek to modify the Commission's ability to condition or disallow foreign investment that may pose a risk of harm to national policies, the array of questions in the notice will significantly improve our ability to analyze the important these important issues in a granular and meaningful way. I'm hopeful that this notice will eventually produce new policies that will promote additional investment in the American ICT sector, thus expanding our economy while spurring innovation and job growth. Many thanks to the talented uh, IB staff uh, for all of your hard work on this. And I'm eager to engage with you and all interested parties as we uh, move forward with our review. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. This is another example of how the Commission is working hard to comply with both the spirit and language of President Obama's executive order instructing federal agencies to remove regulations that unnecessarily impede investment and business development. Section 310B4 of the Communications Act sets a 25% benchmark for investment by foreign entities in U.S. organizations that directly or indirectly control certain FCC licensees. That statute also requires the Commission to review foreign ownership levels which exceed that benchmark to ensure such ownership would not harm our nation's interest in competition, security, law enforcement, foreign policy, or trade policy. But as the item recognizes, the legal and other administrative costs that U.S. parent companies face when trying to comply with 310B4 are not mandated by Congress. Therefore, I commend the International Bureau for crafting proposals that could cut the number of 310B4 petitions filed each year by more than 70 percent. The streamlining measures proposed in this NPRM are not just important because they comply with the presidential directive. In fact, private investment, both domestic and foreign, furthers our interest in maximum broadband adoption and in economic growth. As the National Broadband Plan pointed out, investment in information and communications technologies accounted for more than two-thirds of all economic growth attributed to capital investment in the United States between 1995 and 2005. Therefore, we need to find ways that companies who are interested in investing in the U.S. communications industry will spend less money on legal fees and more money financing our companies. I again thank Mendel Delatore and her talented staff for their leadership on these issues. Thank you, Commissioner Margaret. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mendel and your team, for your work on this today. Uh, thanks to your work, we take another step in the FCC's agency-wide regulatory reform efforts, focusing on eliminating unnecessary regulations and improving the transparency and predictability of the Commission's work. Uh, this is an effort uh, that goes back uh, uh, to the first day of my tenure, and we've made substantial progress on regulatory reform. We've already eliminated more than 50 unneeded regulations. We're working uh, toward eliminating 25 unnecessary data collections. Uh, working together, we've removed or in the process of removing outmoded restrictions on spectrum use, including in the 
WCS, BRS, and EBS uh, bands. Uh, uh, no need to explain each of them, but the, this point is the same. We're looking at all of our spectrum bands to determine uh, where we can remove restrictions that are impeding investment, economic growth, and benefits to consumers. Uh, this morning, of course, we eliminated needless restrictions on wireless backhaul. We've also taken steps to reduce burdens on broadcast radio licensees by allowing them to rely on previous technical filings instead of having to submit a whole new set of filings. And we've begun eliminating the requirements to submit uh, most of the reports uh, currently collected in connection with our international communications reports. This will remove reporting requirements from hundreds of small businesses. Uh, our work over the past years has been consistent with the President's January executive order on improving regulation and regulatory review. When the President issued an executive order in July asking independent agencies to comply with the basic substance of the January order, I welcomed it. And last week I was pleased to say to FCC staff that we would comply with the request in the executive order and that we would perform our responsibilities consistent with the order. I'd like to thank Ruth Milkman for heading up our efforts on regulatory reform and also for her blog post this morning with more detail on steps forward. Uh, I'm grateful to Ruth as well as Austin Schlick, thank you, Marius Schwartz and Jessica Almond for ensuring that our processes and analyses continue to be consistent with the very best practices in government and that they promote innovation, investment and competition to benefit our economy and to benefit all consumers. In today's NPRM, we continue these efforts by proposing to eliminate unnecessary reporting obligations on U.S. wireless companies that have some foreign shareholders. We estimate that our proposal today will mean the reduction uh, by 70 percent, a 70 percent reduction in the number of foreign ownership filings by affected companies, and also significantly reduce the time and cost of each filing. It will also provide greater certainty and transparency regarding the Commission's requirements and review process for wireless common carrier and satellite applicants. The Commission now has no rules clearly explaining the information it requires from these applicants when they seek approval uh, of foreign ownership. Adopting the approach we propose would increase transparency and predictability for companies seeking to invest in the United States. And I echo Commissioner Clyburn's point that investment in this space has had uh, an enormously positive effect for our economy and for job creation. Uh, importantly, we propose to do this in a way that will meet our important obligations on national security, law enforcement, and other issues uh, involving foreign licensees. Commissioner Copps emphasized these points, and I think collectively uh, all of our comments really amount to um, uh, a very focused desire to eliminate restrictions that are needed uh, to make sure that we can continue to do our job in this space, is, uh, this space uh, and others. And I appreciate the staff being very sensitive uh, to uh, getting the balance uh, right, and I think you have. Uh, the NPRM uh, originated with the staff of the International Bureau. Uh, I, I was happy to see a little bit of a healthy uh, uh, internal competition on uh, identifying uh, outdated rules that can be reformed. Uh, so thank you each for uh, your terrific work on this and on other matters in this area. Thank you also to uh, my colleagues for uh, your help and support uh, of this item. Let us proceed to a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. So ordered and the request for editorial privileges is now granted. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you all. What we are going to do now, prior to uh, any closing uh, announcements from my colleagues, is uh, announce uh, the results of um, a terrific annual program that we run at the FCC. We are going to announce the winners of the Commission's Excellence in Economic Analysis uh, and the winners of the Commission's Excellence in Engineering Awards. Uh, uh, I'm particularly pleased uh, uh, to be doing this, uh, and I'm glad uh, we're doing it at a commission meeting because it allows us all to emphasize uh, the very important role that engineers and economists play in our work. 
the nature of the work that we do at the Commission uh, requires the coming together of a broad array of disciplines. Uh, and it includes uh, not only lawyers, of course lawyers play a very important role at the Commission, but also economists, engineers, uh, and people with many different backgrounds. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that the Commission uh, is now working in a way that um, not only allows but encourages uh, all of the various staffers at the Commission from different backgrounds to work together to share with each other the benefits of their different discipline, experience, analytical approaches uh, to challenge uh, each other based on their backgrounds and disciplines, I think this kind of uh, healthy, robust uh, internal exchange that transcends uh, the natural silos that can develop at a place like the FCC, uh, natural silos uh, between bureaus or between uh, people with different backgrounds and disciplines. Uh, we have uh, uh, been trying, and this is something that all of us agree on, uh, to break down those barriers uh, and um, uh, uh, insist on a vibrant, healthy, um, uh, uh, robust uh, interchanges internally uh, to develop the best policies for our economy and for all Americans. And uh, uh, with that unplanned introduction, uh, let's start with the economists. Uh, so this is the tenth year of the award program, which is designed to recognize commission staff for outstanding economic analysis performed in the course of their work at the commission. Um, I think what we will do is um, uh, let me describe the four winners uh, in economic analysis, uh, ask them each as they are announced to come to the front of the room. Uh, let's hold, uh, please, applause until all of the four economists are named. And then, uh, do I have any anything to give the economists or for their their public? But so at a later separate time in a in a private ceremony, we will we will present uh, the plaque and uh, what I just assume is a very large check that's associated with this. But uh, but if not, uh, we'd be happy to provide the plaque. Uh, uh, so first, uh, Paul Lafontaine of the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy. Uh, Paul is being recognized for his work on the Commission's review of the Comcast NBCU transaction, specifically for the analysis, the economic analysis presented in the technical appendix to the Commission order in that proceeding. Uh, so Paul, please come up. Thank you. Uh, Jack Erb of OSP. Jack's award is for his paper Local Information Programming and the Structure of Television Markets. I think the plan, yeah, good. All okay, right, Roger, whatever you tell them to do is. Uh, <laughs> Jack's award is for his paper, Local Information Programming and the Structure of Television Markets, which he wrote as part of the 2010 Quadrennial Review of Media Ownership Regulations. Uh, third, Andy Wise of the Media Bureau. Andy is being recognized for a paper entitled Broadcast Ownership Rules and Innovation also written as part of the 2010 Quadrennial Review of Media Ownership Regulations. And uh, finally, for economic analysis, Pam Megna of the Wireless Competition Bureau. Pam, terrific. Pam's award is for her work on the Commission's Quest Phoenix MSA forbearance order, in particular for the threshold market analysis. Uh, your work exemplifies the high quality and creative economic analysis that the Commission needs to understand how the telecom and media sectors operate and how to make policy decisions that advance the public interest, that promote our economy, that promote uh, and benefit all Americans. So congratulations on your accomplishments. Keep up the good work. Uh, thank you all very much. I want to come Having now uh, hammered out all the kinks, <laughs> it's, it's possible the engineer should have gone first. <laughs> but, uh, 
Uh, but let's turn to uh, the engineers. Um, uh, again, along with our economists, uh, engineers play such an important role in the work of, uh, uh, of the commission. Uh, it's um, uh, beyond important that the commission continue to attract first-rate economists and first-rate uh, engineers. Uh, without them, we simply could not do uh, our job. The Commission's Excellence in Engineering Awards are designed to recognize Commission engineers, scientists, and other technical staff for outstanding engineering, scientific, or technical contributions performed in the course of their work at the Commission. There are five winners this year. Uh, and so again, as I call your name, please come up uh, over here. And if I could ask everyone to withhold their applause until I've had a chance to describe each of the winners. Uh, so first, Chris Andes an engineer in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau in Gettysburg. Is Chris here or is Chris remote? Chris is remote, uh, but hopefully Chris is um, uh, watching us online. Chris developed an analytical tool for assessing opportunities for increasing use of the spectrum in support of the wireless backhaul order. And further notice that the commission adopted this morning. Uh, next, Palash Barua, an engineer in the Enforcement Bureau in Philadelphia. Uh, thank you for being here. Palash prepared an in-depth report that analyzed calibration and measurement uncertainty factors and created a computer program that standardized associated calculations to assist with enforcement actions. Uh, excellent. His work in this area has provided an invaluable tool for the FCC's field agents. Uh, so um, for those of you who are thinking who uh, you can out-engineer the FCC when it comes to enforcement, you are wrong. <laughs> uh, next, Chris Miller, an analyst in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau uh, here at our headquarters. Uh, Chris created a system that eliminates the need for cellular license applicants to file large paper maps, enabling them to file maps in electronic form. Thank you for that. And Michael Mullenix, an engineer in the International Bureau. Oh, uh, well, we are sorry for that, and we wish him, uh, we wish him well. Uh, Michael helped ensure that international policies promote the use of TV white spaces for broadband use. George Tannehill, an engineer in the Office of Engineering and Technology Lab in Columbia, Maryland. George is here. George's work significantly advanced the Commission's equipment authorization program, in particular by negotiating mutual recognition agreements with other countries. Uh, thank you all. Your efforts uh, are instrumental in the Commission's ability to meet the complex technical challenges that we face today and will need to meet as we move into the future. I can tell you that as a, uh, uh, a son of an engineer uh, who um, uh, uh, owes so much to uh, the opportunities that this country uh, provides to uh, encourage uh, young engineers to succeed. Uh, in my case, it was my father. Uh, I'm just very pleased to see uh, uh, your efforts, your success, and on behalf of each of my colleagues, I know that uh, we are beyond uniform in recognizing uh, the general importance that engineers and economists play at the FCC and in being uh, particularly pleased by the excellent work uh, that's uh, described uh, in these awards and your achievements and your work uh, on behalf of the agency, uh, in behalf of the public. So uh, thank you um, all of much. Congratulations. Uh, well, I'm so glad we did that. Uh, let me ask my colleagues if uh, there are any announcements to make it this time. Commissioner Cobbs? Well, I'd just like to uh, join in congratulating the, uh, uh, the nine uh, winners who we recognize today. Uh, they're a very distinguished group of experts and uh, colleagues, and it really shows the range of work that our economists and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, engineers do running the gamut from media to spectrum to white spaces to enforcement to international cooperation. Uh, I want to commend the chairman on his remarks with regard to the 
interdisciplinary uh, approach. It takes lots of different skills and skill sets to make a place like this run. Maybe someday we'll even have an uh, historian's award. I don't know. That might be, uh, <laughs> might be a good idea, although we don't have too many uh, around here, but they're always needed. Uh, and, and just finally, we honor these folks as uh, individuals, but also as emblematic of the uh, FCC uh, uh, workforce generally, which uh, I think is a, a, a shining ornament in uh, public service. Everybody who works here is proud of these individuals who uh, are singled out for recognition today, but they should also be proud of themselves and the job they do in behalf of the uh, uh, of the public uh, interest. This is a workforce that does uh, so much for so many, at such little cost, we even pay for ourselves around here as a, as a commission. So uh, uh, congratulations to, uh, to everybody, and it's an honor for me to uh, uh, have been able to work here for 10 years with such a fine group of uh, dedicated public servants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to echo uh, the distinguished uh, gentleman from well, various states that you've lived, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, former acting chairman cops. Uh, so um, I do believe at the FCC we have the finest uh, public servants uh, in all of government and uh, I commend the chairman for uh, elevating these recognitions uh, to the uh, the open meetings. Um, it's, it's very important for us to tell you directly uh, to, to everyone who works here but especially those who deserve special recognition for going the extra mile uh, as to how much we appreciate what you do uh, you do what you do because there's a call to public service. Uh, you, you're not doing it for the glory or the fame because there really isn't any and there certainly isn't uh, much money in all this. Uh, but what you do does help make uh, America a better place to work, live, and raise a family. And uh, we, you, you're examples to all of your peers and to folks on the outside. And uh, when we hear a, a lot of uh, uh, smack uh, talked about uh, in political debates about uh, public servants, uh, you, you are held up as examples of, of what is the finest in, in all of them and uh, are terrific examples. So, so thank you. Um, and uh, it's hard enough to uh, recruit good people to government. It's even harder to retain them. And so I thank the chairman for uh, at least giving these uh, recognitions the extra elevation that they deserve. And I know under acting chairman Copps, uh, uh, this started as well. So I wanted to thank him as well. Um, so uh, all of my summer law clerks have left for the summer, but uh, uh, we do have uh, someone who's been shadowing me for a couple of days. Luke, if you want to stand up. We have Luke Aaron, who's a little bit of a celebrity. Uh, Luke uh, is a rising, Luke is an experiment in my office. I've had two experiments, uh, one undergrad and now a rising high school senior at Deerfield Academy, my, uh, my alma mater in Deerfield, Massachusetts, uh, rising senior. Uh, he uh, is a bit of a celebrity because he has been ranked number one by ESPN and Inside Lacrosse as uh, the rising junior, last year rising junior high school lacrosse goalie in the country. Um, and as such, uh, he is verbally committed to Duke University. The fact that um, these two schools happen to coincide had nothing to do with me uh, letting him shadow me for a couple of days. I just wanted everyone to know that. But, um, he also has been able to pick up very quickly in some of the issues we've been working on here, and I've uh, been very impressed uh, by him. Uh, it uh, comes as no surprise that he uh, maintains his academic honor roll status at Deerfield Academy and uh, has had many academic awards throughout his uh, career, but also has a big heart. He's a Special Olympics uh, swim coach, um, and perhaps a little unknown fact is that he's a dance performer at uh, Deerfield's Performing Arts Showcases. I was going to ask him to do some interpretive dance of the items we voted on today. <laughs> but. We have a no hazing rule in my office, so I, I just decided not to do that. So um, anyway, I'm still thinking about it, though, before you leave. Um, we're hoping we can influence him to have a career in public service. I think he's probably the youngest person we've had to intern uh, in my office uh, uh, for this length of time. But uh, either way, Luke's got a, a very bright future, so just wanted to welcome, welcome him. It is always my pleasure to follow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jack, uh, Paul, Andy, Pam, Chris, Palash, Chris, Michael, and George. Congratulations uh, for all that uh, for you uh, for all that you do. And I'm I'm hoping this meeting is often televised. I hope that uh, persons will replay this part of uh, the uh, session. Um, to me. Uh, which is very significant uh, to highlight those talented persons that the nine of you represent 
that make uh, this agency and, and, and this nation great. Um, you've committed your lives to public service. Uh, we are so grateful, uh, and we're grateful that you stayed here uh, to augment um, and to make this look um, easier, even with handkerchiefs and all, uh, uh, to make this, um, to make our lives um, easier and again, to uh, benefit the American public. Thank you so much for, um, for what you do and for your commitment. Uh, today marks a bittersweet time for the Clyburn team and that we are officially saying goodbye to our 2011 summer interns. If you would stand, Eva Torres, Jonathan Whitaker, and Nathaniel Nett Brown brought intelligence, curiosity, and enhanced veracity to our office. And it is our hope that this session's experience has augmented their commitment to and interest in the law and in public service. I want to personally and publicly thank you for the incredible work uh, that you've done and for your superior temperament. And while it is true that we will miss the dyna dynamic trio, uh, uh, we are upbeat about what lies ahead for you and that many others will have the opportunity to benefit your talents like our office did. Godspeed. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Madam Secretary, would you please announce the date of the next FCC meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, September 22nd, 2011. Thank you. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome. And we're going to go with the usual roles. So we'll start on the left uh, this morning with Jasmine Melvin from Workers. I, I would just like to begin by uh, saying uh, happy birthday uh, to Neil. Uh, as of 10 days from today, I just discovered that we have the same birthday. Did not know this, uh, but I apologize. Go ahead. Um, can you tell us a little more about uh, what uh, went into the FCC's deci decision to link its reviews of AT&T's proposed deals with Qualcomm and T-Mobile, and will that affect the suggested one-year timeline for the review of the T-Mobile merger? Well, I don't have anything really to add to what um, Rick Kaplan, as the Wireless Bureau Chief, said yesterday. He'll be up here soon, and he may be able to say a little bit more uh, uh, obviously, we're assigned important responsibilities by Congress in reviewing transactions, and uh, we exercise those responsibilities uh, both trying to be as efficient as possible uh, and also recognizing our obligations uh, to look at serious issues uh, seriously. Um, I'm wondering if you have any comment on the decision by telecom companies, I think it was about a week ago, on universal service fund reform. They came out with their own plan. I'm wondering if you have any comment on that. Well, as you know, we've been uh, working on uh, a major modernization and transformation of the Universal Service Fund for over a year now, uh, recognizing that doing that um, uh, will be of tremendous benefit to driving broadband deployment in the United States, particularly in, in rural areas. And over the course of the last several months, we've asked uh, everyone with an interest, everyone with a stake in this to roll up their sleeves and participate with us as we roll up our sleeves in taking a very complex set of problems and solving them. Because, of course, this includes not just the Universal Service Fund, which is challenging enough on its own to sort through, but also intercarrier compensation. And we made the decision earlier on that both of those reforms need to happen together. So I'm pleased that a number of different entities over time have taken uh, us up on our call to do work to help us resolve this. Uh, the members of the uh, federal state joint board uh, did so earlier, um, uh, recently a group uh, of companies did that. Uh, others have been participating actively in our record. Uh, I think you probably also saw that we put out for comment recently uh, some ideas that came both from the joint board and from uh, the uh, USTA group that uh, we thought needed uh, specific public input. So um, I remain uh, uh, committed to doing everything I can to get this done. Uh, it makes no sense to continue to have a universal service fund system and intercarrier comp system 
that is not efficiently focused on deploying broadband um, where it doesn't exist, uh, that doesn't provide everywhere incentives for networks to upgrade to broadband-enabled IP networks. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to continue to have a program that operates uh, inefficiently, that wastes money. Uh, reform is overdue. Uh, uh, and um, uh, these steps that we've seen over the last couple of months will be helpful uh, in uh, the, this, uh, what I hope is the final stage uh, of, together with my colleagues on the commission, uh, uh, reaching conclusion on a comprehensive reform of the Universal Service Fund and intercarrier compensation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Recently, consumer interest groups have expressed concern about the growing practice of usage-based pricing and anti-competitive effects. Has your thinking on this evolved at all since you spoke about it last December, and if so, how? Uh, well, it's always, uh, I'm always ashamed to say my thinking hasn't evolved on something because thinking should always uh, evolve. Uh, you know, fundamentally, usage-based pricing and competitive markets can provide consumers more choice. Uh, they can allow consumers who use less to be charged less. They also drive uh, efficiency uh, in the system and encourage investment uh, in uh, our networks. Uh, so uh, I think the thinking um, that, 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 that we described uh, uh, before uh, largely reflects my, my current thinking. Like, any, like everything else, the staff of the agency uh, uh, is under um, uh, persistent instruction to stay proactive on what's going on in the marketplace. Uh, and, um, and of course, they do that. Uh, in what ways has the results of the SAMNOS broadband performance testing helped to evolve your thinking? Do you have any new ideas on either what consumers should be given or the transparency from the net neutrality that relates to this, this what we've learned from the speed testing? Well, I, you know, so there are, uh, to me, there were two um, work streams, uh, as you will, in that process, or two sets of potential benefits that we saw coming in and that I see coming out. One is the positive effects that transparency can have on um, what, bro what broadband providers do. Uh, I believe that because we announced that we would do these tests. And because it was very well known to the providers that we were doing these tests, because um, uh, they participated in the tests, uh, and they knew the results would be public, that created healthy incentives to reduce the gap between what's, what's advertised and what's provided. Uh, uh, and so I think it was a very good proof point in the positive relationship of transparency to um, uh, healthy outcomes for consumers. Um, and then s the, the second, so that's kind of company focused. The, the second is consumer focused. And in various ways, you've heard over the last year, we've talked about um, this transition period we're in where many consumers don't understand many of the basic um, terms that are at the heart of the, these new services. Uh, what's a megabyte? What's latency? How many megabytes do you need if you're just emailing? How many megabytes do you need if you um, uh, uh, are a small business that wants to do video conferencing? How many megabytes do you need if you are, if your uh, child is a student that wants to do video tutoring or distance learning? Uh, etc. And one of the things that we very much wanted to do and did in connection with that is continue to work on helping consumers better understand the relationship between speed and particular uses, uh, 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 dealing both with speeds and, and latency. Uh, and so we, we, as you saw, we released some documents uh, that helped do that. We'll continue to do more. Joel Gurren is the chief of our Consumer Bureau. This is one of his uh, biggest priorities to, um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in creative ways to help consumers understand 
um, to, have in, to help them understand and to help them have the information they need to uh, make the most informed choices about their products, which is just fair to them. Consumers shouldn't be spending more than they need to spend or less than they should spend to get what they want. Uh, and also uh, to induce healthy competition in the marketplace. Hi, Mr. Chairman, Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. Uh, given the letter from Senator Cole asking you to block the AT&T T-Mobile merger and given at and submission of new economic models, can you tell us whether the transaction's in trouble here at the agency? Thanks. <laughs> you know, as you know, I don't comment uh, uh, specifically on pending transactions. As I've said before, uh, the transaction presents uh, a number of serious issues. Our work is very, uh, uh, we'll do a serious uh, and thorough review of that transaction, uh, which is ongoing, as you know. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Hey. Um, as you might, may know, various congratulations, people at, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, various people at Light Squared have expressed concern that Verizon and AT and T may be funding uh, lobbying efforts against Light Squared in Washington, and I was wondering if that's a concern for you. You know, I, I'm not the right person to ask about that. What we are focused on is uh, an engineering-based, fact-based uh, resolution of an interference dispute uh, that exists here. And, and uh, um, we continue to encourage a process, uh, an inclusive process of engineers from uh, all affected parties um, uh, uh, to do their work, which continues. But would you be concerned that they'd be trying to nip a competitor in the bud before it can even get off the ground? Again, I'm not going to comment on on, uh, on speculation. Uh, my focus is on making sure that we have a fact-based uh, process to resolve interference issues. Mr. Chairman, good afternoon. Paul Corson from CNN. Nice to see you. Good. Um, can you tell us anything ahead of a background briefing for us today as to whether Light, Scribe, Light Squared has reassured the Commission and its engineers that it is uh, taking a good mitigation approach to the interference potential. Well, I think uh, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, I'm sure you'll learn uh, things at the briefing. As I said, my focus is on making sure that uh, the process is fact-based, engineering-based. Uh, uh, everyone involved in the process wants to make sure uh, that GPS uh, uh, is not interfered with. We all use GPS. We understand its important value uh, in our system. Uh, everyone involved in the process also understands the benefits of uh, uh, a new service uh, in terms of investment, jobs, and a new competitor. Uh, what will determine the outcome will be the facts uh, and the engineering, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll see that today. But one of the things, Chairman, we need on the record is your assessment of what we're going to get on background shortly. Do you, are you reassured? Is there a sense that this is actually going to mitigate it for Light Squared to move their service farther away from consumer GPS where the interference potential is greater? Well, as I said, we're in the middle of a, uh, uh, of a process. Uh, 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 I think it's important for that process to continue, an engineering fact-based process. As I said before, we're not going to do anything that uh, creates problems for GPS safety and service. Uh, um, uh, as we um, uh, 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 explore technical solutions that will both protect GPS and allow a new service to launch that will lead to billions of dollars of private investment, real job creation and competition. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll now proceed to part two of the press conference, the Bureau items. We'll start with the wireless. Rick Kaplan, Chief of the Wireless Bureau, and his team. Questions on wireless backhaul? Lynn? Could you just uh, lay out which bands are affected by this order and, and how much total spectrum that involves? Well, actually, the, 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 uh, let me call about uh, John Trouble who can address that. Can you come to the mic, please? Sure. The, the band, what the exact bands that I have. How much spectrum is involved? If you 
about the specific pieces of the band? It's a 7 and 13 gigahertz band. Do you want the exact? I, I think I can live with 7 and 13 gigahertz bands and just the total amounts. Yeah, it's uh, adding 650 megahertz 650 of new spectrum megahertz. in the 7 and 13 gigahertz bands. And that's like on a secondary basis sharing with the people that are already there or it, 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 it varies? It's co-primary, protecting the existing operators in there, co-primary after that. Thank you. Anything else? I got a couple more oh, if nobody else is. Right. Okay. Um, does the FNPRM address the possibility of allowing wireless backhaul operations in the white, TV white spaces? No, that, that's uh, that's a set, sort of a separate issue altogether. Okay. This is uh, d distinct from that. And then my last question, and I apologize if this is really stupid, but uh, not my regular beat. Um, these small antennas that are talked about in connection with the FNPRM, why in the past were they required to be bigger? I thought sort of the the minimum size of a, an antenna was sort of based on physics. You need a certain size for the amplitude of the wave, and so I why don't know were you requiring them to be bigger? Idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So generally in the microwave bands, the bigger the dish you have, the, the tighter the beam is. and So it's, a, it's sort of a trade-off. Smaller antennas, at least, potentially can cause some more interference to nearby operations. But the idea is as technology is evolving, the question, you know, periodically reviewing our regulations to make, take advantage of new technology, advances in technology, and see if we can allow smaller antennas and provide the benefits okay. of those and antennas. And so this doesn't have anything to do with um, how many antennas you would need to serve a certain area. This is backhaul, and it's nothing like the, the smaller cells that you deal with for the Correct. It's, it's sort of the size of the dish. Uh, okay. yeah, we just add that the size of the, yeah, the, the size of the dish has an effect on the economics of deployment, so that's part of why we're asking this question and then maybe that we hear from people different parts of the country or different regions the answer is different so we're just trying to take a fresh look at the rules okay thank you uh that's it for wireless backhaul thank you thank you gentlemen and we'll now turn to item two the foreign ownership mendel de la tour from the international bureau Any questions on the, no, I guess I should have asked that first. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you very much. You. No, no questions. And that concludes the press conference and that concludes today's agenda meeting. Thank you very much. The reporter's coming up to the briefing, uh, just follow me.